I am here with Malin Issachar Martin, who was born on July 19, 1932, using the United States Air Force, with his highest rank being Chief Master Sergeant. This interview is being recorded on April 16, 2012, in his home in Geneva, Florida. I will be conducting the interview today, and my name is Jay Stewart. So, where were you born, Mr. Martin? I was born in a little uh, small town in uh, named Brooklyn, Mississippi. What kind of education did you have before you joined the military? Education? Mm -hmm. uh, very uh, lived in a very rural area. We were uh, we were sharecroppers, and uh, so I only finished the eighth grade eighth grade in school. Finished the uh, eighth grade, and uh, and since I finished the eighth grade, uh, I worked a little bit for a couple of years or whatever, and uh, signed up with a carnival and traveled around the country working the carnival, and then uh, then in, and when I got seventeen, I enlisted in the enlisted in the Air Force when I was seventeen. And why did you decide to join the military? Well. They, uh, being, being the son of sharecroppers, there was 12 of us kids in the family, and uh, there was no future of what we were doing. We, 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 worked, we worked farms for everybody, and, and there was no, uh, the only industry in that area at the time was uh, cotton picking, probably, and, and, uh, and uh, timber, cutting uh, timber, usually uh, what they call pulpwood, cutting pulpwood. And that's the only that's the only things that were, were there at the time was that, and uh, so uh, the only out we had was uh, was to try to find something to, that we, we'd make a little bit of money to support our to support send back to the parents, you know. So I joined when I was seventeen, and they ended up being uh, uh, seven boys in our family, and all seven of us ended up in the military. Why did you decide to join the Air Force as opposed to any other branches? Uh, I'd always heard that it was uh, a little bit better quality service. It was, uh, uh, in fact, at the time, uh, you had to, you, the testing was uh, it was different for the Air Force. You had to make a certain test and all. You took a uh, took exam with a, at the office, at the recruiter's office, and they kind of told you what you were qualified. If you didn't make a very high score, then you'd uh, they'd, you'd end up recommend you go to the army or whatever, as a uh, you know a rifleman or something. But my scores were uh, were high. In fact, there was a thing in the paper there in my little hometown. Uh, they were saying that I'd made the highest score they ever recorded in that recruiting office. And uh, so I qualified. Uh, they recommended I go into Air Force because that was where most of the high tech jobs were. You know. Where did you attend basic training? At Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. What did you think about it, basic training? To me, it was a vacation because I was used to working farms all the time. I was used to working from daylight to dark and uh, not having uh, very much food many times, you know, going leaving the table hungry. And here I was, uh, not only did they give me a um, Clothing and shoes and and a place to stay and three meals a day and and I gained uh, I gained about ten or fifteen pounds while I was in basic training, where most people uh, lose weight because of the um, hiking and the exercise and all. And to me, it, it was just it was like a vacation because I I didn't find it difficult at all, you know. What was your specialty in those days? I started off. I started off uh, as a, a radio operator. And I think probably because my I had an uh, older half brother who was a radio operator in World War II, and I think that kind of influenced me. And uh, so I started off as a radio operator. And uh, the idea of an international Morse code, learning that that those that code, you know, to communicate with and all, was kind of interesting. And so I started off as uh, as a what they call later on as a high-speed intercept operator, because we I spent a lot of time on remote sites, uh, 
intercepting uh, traffic from uh, with International Mars Code. Uh, anything, it, no, no matter where it came from, I could, because I was just in code, uh, so I could, didn't matter where it was, uh, Russians or Chinese or what, uh, c coming from where it was coming from, it was in, if it was in International Mars Code, then I could type it up, and the, then the, and they could, uh, they could uh, transcribe it then and figure out what they were saying. You know. How did you come about this specialty as a radio operator? Uh, I went to school in uh, at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi after I got a basic. I went to uh, radio operator school in the, in the Keesler Air Force Base, Mississippi, in Biloxi, Mississippi. And that's it. It's about a, I think about a nine month school. Where were you first deployed after training? Well, after I after I finished radio school uh, in uh, Keesler, uh, they I stayed I stayed uh, they asked me to stay on there as an instructor. So I stayed on. Uh, I agreed to stay there as an instructor. So I I spent the first my first assignment other than school in basic training was with an instructor at uh, the radio department at Keesler. And then after uh, I'd been there for, uh, I guess, on a few months or almost a year or so, uh, then I, my first assignment was to, uh, was in uh, to uh, Goose Bay, Labrador. I went to Goose Bay, Labrador. And when I got there, that was because I left, uh, I left uh, Mississippi in the summer, and it was about a, Hundred degrees or more, and I go up uh, up north and where it was uh, below zero still. So, and then when I got to Goose Bay, there was a you had an eighteen month tour there. You had to stay there eighteen months, but uh, they would re knock off six months if I would agree to go to a remote site. And so, uh, so I, I agreed and signed up to go to a to a remote site. You know, roughly what time was this? As in, that was in 1952. Uh, I don't remember exactly in the spring of spring summer 1952. So until then, I listed in 50, went to Radio Opera School in in 51, and uh, and then uh, and, and and I was instructor down for the latter part of 51 and in the early part of 52. Then I went to Goose Bay, Labrador in 52. Did you receive any special training before you went to the remote site? We had to um, we had to go through had to be a, uh, some psychological evaluation because of being remote, uh, and uh, the group of us had to stay in a uh, a little underground barracks by ourselves for a couple of weeks and all to see if everybody got along or something, nobody blew the top or caused a problem, you know. So I, we, we were together for a few weeks, I don't remember how long, and all we, we did was go from where we lived to, uh, to the dining hall and back, and then uh, during that period of time we were psychologically evaluated and also uh, had uh, physical exams because there was no uh, medical facilities where we were going. So we had to be checked over physically to make sure we, we were okay. In fact, uh, that was one of the first times I had probably been to a dentist in my life. And uh, when I went, when they checked me, at the, the dental uh, dentist checked me. I, I had five teeth that needed to be filled, and I was supposed to leave like the next day to go to Pad Loping to the remote. And so he said, "Well, we can't do that, you know." Then said, "We just have to cancel you because you know." You gotta have these teeth filled because if it goes bad while you're there, there's nothing we can do about it, you know. So uh, he said, "There's one uh, one option." Said, "If you think you can stand it, uh, me filling all five of them without a painkiller, then uh, I'll do them all right now." So that's what I agreed to. So I had five teeth filled without any deadening, you know. And so that uh, so that once I had that done, I was okay okay then to go to remote. What did you think as you were going through these initial tests? 
Well, of course, I, I guess uh, uh, Goose Bay in the early days was, uh, it wasn't a dream assignment. So uh, anything I think anybody would, to, to get knock off six months of your tour, would, would, I would go through, you know. So, uh, so just, uh, I think just out, and, and it was something different, you know. I was, I was single at the time, and, and, uh, and I enjoyed what I did as a radio operator, and I was going up there as a radio operator. So, um, I didn't, I, I, I thought, I thought it was exciting and great, because it was a once of a chance, lifetime chance to do something, but not many people had ever done, you know. What made Goose Bay so difficult? So, it, well, uh, for, I was, I was, remember I'd only been in the service like two years at the time. So, uh, so I had not been around and seen any other place and all as to how it was, you know, and, uh, and I found out later on, uh, mainly because of the, uh, the skills I was trained in. I ended up in a lot of places that were worse than Goose Bay. But at the time, I thought that was one of the worst places I'd, I'd I thought, I thought I'd never find any place. Well, it was just freezing cold all the time, you know, and, and I, every, everything was dirt roads. There was no pavement, nothing. Uh, when it rained, it was muddy. When it snowed, it was uh, very deep, you know. And I worked out, uh, when I was at Goose, the time I was at Goose, uh, I worked out at, the, at a receiver intercept site, which was about 20 miles out in the boonies away from the base. So we had to load up every morning on the six by trucks, big open six by trucks, and uh, they'd haul us 20 miles out into the boonies to where the receiver site was. It was kind of a hidden place, you know. And it had all of these, it had these huge, big uh, antennas, what we call antenna farms. Just uh, hundreds and hundreds of antennas strung all over the place to intercept uh, any any uh, communications that we could, you know. What type of communications were you trying to intercept? Yeah, well, we tra we 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 handled a lot of traffic from uh, from uh, say Greenland and Newfoundland and all that would pass through uh, our facility uh, and transmit it on. Then on, on to uh, the U.S. Um, but a lot of times, well, most of the time, we I just sat there for eight hour eight hour shift with a set of earphones on and just typing up uh, international Mars code. And it comes uh, Mars code is sent out in uh, no matter what since that's why it's international Mars code. All countries use it, and not and, and not the American North Mars code. You know. International Morse Code, and uh, <clears throat> all countries use it, and uh, and it goes out in uh, in five character increments. You get you get five characters, and then there's a space, and five characters, and five characters, and five characters. So uh, no matter no matter what you get, where it's uh, where it's where it's uh, uh, crypto crypto or not, where it's uh, it goes out in the form of five characters, and each each character, each five digits, is considered a word, even though they, for ease of taking it, they do five characters at a time. You do five and five, five and five and five. Then whenever we type that up, we type it up just as we hear it, and then uh, and those codes, those numbers that might be A B C D E on there, but when it goes to the crypto. Uh, Process it comes out being hello, maybe you know instead of that. So when you were sent after the training to the remote site, where were you sent? Uh, to the remote site. Yeah. <coughs> actually, left. It. <coughs> uh, after I left Goose Bay, I was sent around. After I left the instructor duty, I went to Goose Bay. There was a short period of time because I volunteered for, for the remote, and I was sent there to uh, Padlopen Island, which is in the Northwest Territory, and it's on in the uh, a group of islands called the Baffin Islands, but it's about uh, 150. It's up north of the Arctic Circle, and um, we we flew from Goose Bay Goose Bay to. Uh, 
base called Frobisher Bay, and that is the Nunavut headquarters now, this capital of Nunavut. That's a new, a new, a new Eskimo uh, uh, town village. And so, uh, anyway, we flew into Frobisher Bay on a big uh, cargo plane, and uh, and from Frobisher Bay we loaded onto a seaplane. And I happen to remember it was a, it called an SA-16 seaplane, a two-engine seaplane, and uh, it flew us into Padlopin, and we landed on the on the water between the. It was still, it was still floating uh, icebergs and stuff around, but we were uh, the, the, there was a bay there that pretty, pretty once it's uh, once it was iceberg free, then it was pretty safe to land there, you know. So we landed on the bay. There at uh, Pad Open Island. What did you do after you landed? Well, the very day I landed, uh, they, see the people, that, the people that were there before, uh, they were taken out the same time we went in. So we went from uh, got off the seaplane and went up and uh, went to work immediately. They set me down at a radio site, uh, radio uh, position, and. Uh, there was five of us radio operators uh, there, and uh, we worked 24 hours a day, worked around the clock with the shift work, and uh, we had a, had a big stack of, uh, of uh, I remember our call sign there, uh, even in the, in the code was uh, AKZ-30, because that, the, uh, the, uh, the name of, had open island for Air Force use and always Crystal Three. Was it during the designation Crystal Three? So Crystal Three, uh, Pad Open Island was known as Crystal Crystal Three, and so AKZ 30, 30 was meant for the three. So that AKZ thirty was our was our uh, call sign, and so we we sent both uh, voice voice communications. And uh, code in Morse code, and we had about I don't know, probably seven or eight receivers that we had to monitor all of those at one time, one person, and answer any calls that came in, and then all, at the same time we had uh, any any traffic that came in in, in international Morse code, and we had, had to type it up and forwarded it on to wherever. We were like a relay station for wherever it's supposed to go to, whether it be back to the States or to or coming from the States to, to Greenland or wherever it's going to. You know. So we were, a, we really were radio relay station but and a weather station. And uh, one thing we had to do, uh, uh, we had a couple of weathermen there, was we recorded the weather and for planes flying over between, say, the United States and, uh, and Greenland, uh, then as they passed over, they need to know what the weather was everywhere, so, so what the winds are going to be in our area and all, what temperature was and so on. So we, uh, we would let balloons go up uh, with it. And uh, in the daytime, you could see them okay with it. It's called a theodolite. You sight them through there. And you take a reading every two or three, two or three minutes, and then that tells you how you know, the balloon floating up, if it, and it moves one way or the other way, and all it tells you how the winds are like, all these different altitudes. And at night time, you, you, you tie a little basket on the bottom of the balloon, and it has a candle in it. And then uh, you blow the balloon up inside that little basket. It's a collapsible basket, like a Japanese lantern, and it pops open. You put a candle in the middle of it and light the candle, and at night then you let the balloon go and you still view it through the theode light. And then uh, every so the, the balloon uh, with a helium in it ascends at a certain rate. So then if I if I take a reading every every uh, minute or whatever every thirty seconds, then I can tell how high it is. So I can tell what the wind, what direction the wind is at that altitude. You know, all the way up until it. So it's out of sight, you know. So that was interesting because I, uh, 
I learned a lot. <clears throat> when you own a remote site like that, you learn how to do everything. Because uh, most of the time we cooked our own uh, own meals. You know, we had most everything was dehydrated or powdered. We had dehydrated milk, dehydrated eggs. Uh, most everything uh, was no fresh fruit or vegetables. Nothing. And then, uh, then also uh, our our water supply came from a uh, freshwater lake about three or four miles away, and uh, we had to take turns hauling water from the lake. We had no running water there, so uh, so we we had a big uh, caterpillar, and everybody had to learn how to drive a caterpillar, a big D8 caterpillar, and we had the trailer uh, to hooked on the back of it. it had a 500 gallon tank on it. The trailer had tracks on it. And had a 500 gallon water tank on the back, so we would about once a week. Then we would we would hook on the, and take the tractor and trailer over to this lake and pump water out of the lake and bring it back and then pump it into a, a tank inside the building, so it wouldn't freeze, you know. And then the uh, winter time, uh, when we went over to get the ice, the bay, because the lake is froze completely over, so we have to. Uh, drill a hole through the ice and use it two or three feet thick down to the down to the water and then pump the water out of there with a uh, with a uh, little, little pump you know and the pump would be frozen we used a blowtorch to heat up the pump so you throw it out and have to crank it up and then you pump the water from uh, from the lake into the tank 500 gallon tank and the three or four miles you had to get back to the it's about well, about halfway up the island, I guess. It's about a couple of miles to, to get back to the uh, site, where the water would be frozen inside the tank. And then we had to we had a little shed there. We back the back the trailer in, and we had a, a furnace in there, run off of diesel fuel, and uh, we turned the furnace up high to thaw out the water in the tank, so we could pump it out of the tank into the building tank. You know. And so, uh, so we were rationed. You could take it, allowed to take a shower like once a week. And you, you, there's no laundry, none. You had to wash your own clothes, to wash your own linen, do everything you had to do. Totally, totally, totally independent, you know. And uh, uh, everybody had to pitch in because that was, uh, you know, you, we had we had a few Eskimos that, we had five Eskimos that worked uh, worked doing odd jobs for us there. Uh, that were that lived on the island somewhere around, you know, and we paid them uh, out of our own pocket. You might say we weren't allowed to give them money or nothing, but we paid them in cigarettes, and, and each one of the Eskimos got five packs of cigarettes a week, and that's that was their salary for working for us, you know. But in addition to that, <clears throat> we had our storehouse, our store, our store, man to handle the stores. Uh, uh, warehousing. E each family, each Eskimo in the family was allowed to have so many pounds of sugar, coffee, or tea, or whatever it was we had that we could give them, you know. So they got the, their five packs of cigarettes, those five people, but the entire Eskimo population there uh, probably would, probably counting the families, the five guys that worked there and all their families, there was probably 30, 40 family members. And so we supplied all of those with most of their uh, edibles, you know, except the meat and fish that they got themselves, you know. <coughs> How many people were you with? <coughs> yeah. That's what I recall, uh, as far as the Air Force goes, there was nine of us, nine people. And uh, so our, our, our entire job was basically a radio relay. Uh, try, taking messages from here to send them to here and, and listen for uh, any unusual signals coming in that might be from Russia or whatever. And uh, so anything that came in that we picked up on our on our receivers, then we had big, huge, tall antennas. And anything we picked up, we uh, we typed up and sent it back to the 
be either evaluated or something else. Were there other branches there other than the Air Force? No, just Air Force. What was your relationship like with the other men? <coughs> uh, you have to be, since we had psychological evaluation before, everybody got along fine, you know. Uh, uh, that's five, uh, five radio operators. The rest of the people mostly worked days straight. Uh, the other three or four guys worked uh, daytime all the time. But that's, 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 since we had to have communication 24 hours, well, we worked shift work all the time. So we had a, we had a little Quonset hut off to our south that the five of us lived in. And in fact, uh, <coughs> and then the Quonset hut, it had, uh, it had no, uh, no facilities, no water, no, no nothing. It had a heater, a diesel fuel run by heat of a diesel fuel. And so uh, if we wanted to go to the bathroom or something at night, we had to dress and I'll completely dress in the wintertime. Summer it wasn't too bad. And, uh, and travel uh, all the way from our, our hut down to the main building. It's the only place they had a bathroom. And the bathroom, there's no flush toilets there. They use, they use up there in the remote what they call, a, we call it a honey bucket. And you've got a toilet and all, you know, but it, uh, the, the buildings are raised up high because of the snow depth in the wintertime. They're about eight feet or so out of the ground on stilts or whatever. And underneath there then, they have a big container underneath there under the toilet. <laughs> so that's where, where you go in the toilet, it drops down underneath there in a big container. And, uh, and, that, and every summer when everything's thawed out pretty well, well, the Eskimos' job, one of their job, is uh, to take and empty those things, dip it out with five-gallon buckets and all, and haul it off and dump it somewhere, you know. <coughs> what was, what were some of the most difficult things you encountered while in, in the site? Uh, well, the, 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 when, uh, right after we got there and started, um, before the bay, before the bay froze over entirely, they brought in a, uh, a LST, what they call an LST, a landing ship transport, and the Navy, and our usually CBs or Navy, and uh, they brought in our fuel and all for the winter, you know, uh, and so uh, they brought in fourteen hundred barrels of diesel fuel. And so us people that lived there, us a half a dozen or so people, nine of us, we had to, they just dumped all the fuel off. They were worried about the bays freezing over by that time, and they got to get in and out, you know. So they dumped all the stuff down on the, uh, on the shore of the bay. So we have to haul all this stuff of 1,400 barrels of diesel fuel from down by the shoreline. Uh, usually we'd have hook up the uh, the uh, Caterpillar to make a sled, a big sled, probably about six foot by twelve foot, you know, wood sled, and, and roll those barrels up on the there and haul it, haul them up to our to a petroleum storage place for use through the winter. It has to be somewhere where you can get to it, because once the snow comes up with snow, you don't know where it's at, you know. So uh, that was the biggest job was uh, hauling diesel fuel up, and then. Uh, in order to get our supplies and stuff, uh, we uh, we had no regular supply routes or nothing. <coughs> so they would uh, we ordered if we whatever we needed we uh, we kept a at the we ordered you know we we go online online it's like a, not online here but we on our some our communication circuit and I'd send them Morse code back to Goose Bay and we'd order. 50 gallons of flour or whatever it was, whatever, whatever all we needed, you know, we'd order. And then whenever they got enough to uh, warrant a airplane coming up, then they would uh, they would fly an airplane over, overhead, and drop it by parachute. So uh, there's no place to land, you know. So they would fly over and uh, and drop our supplies by parachute, and then. Uh, 
and then it it uh, usually uh, usually it's, uh, it uh, usually sells snow and ice on the bay, and uh, we'd we'd get Eskimos to eat it. We'd get with the Eskimos, and uh, they would hook up their dog sleds, and uh, but as a, as the parachutes came down, they'd go out. We'd go out with them with on the dog sleds <laughs> and retrieve the parachutes, you know. And uh, depending on what the parachute they colored. They tried to keep the parachutes, the colored ones, if it had uh, if it had like meat on it, you couldn't leave it out there because the Eskimo dogs would uh, it'd be gone in two seconds, you know. So they'd let us know that they, say the green parachutes have uh, perishables on it, you know. So then uh, we'd watch for those to come and head for those, try to get those first. They'd drop them out in the big open bay area, you know. And, and then, uh, so that was, uh, and the, it was a big event. Was the uh, airplanes coming over, and uh, then at Christmas time, uh, and so we couldn't send any mail out or anything. Uh, the only way we could communicate with our families back in the states was uh, through Morse code. We send it. We could send it. We were out there. We could send like five hundred words a month, and uh, so we'd send by Morse code back to Goose Bay, and then and, and Goose Bay, and we'd. We'd tell them, uh, hello, mama, daddy, whoever, whatever. Tell them what you want to in a few words. And then, uh, and then give them the, give them the address, and they would type it. They would uh, type it up. It would come to them in, in Morse code, but they'd type it out, and uh, we could read it, you know, and translate it. And then put it in an envelope and then mail it to whoever it was in the States, you know. So they'd get a, could get a letter from us maybe once a month saying, all you'd say is, well, we're okay, you know, and tell whatever, you know. And But they could write to us, but they, it would, the only time the mail came was when the next airdrop, you know. Then they would, they would get mail, you know, next airdrop. Uh, Christmas time, they, uh, one thing, one thing neat was the, uh, the clubs back in the, uh, Goose Bay, like the Officer's Wives Club, Non-Commissioned Officer's Wives Club, uh, various other clubs around. They were very good at uh, doing things for the remote sites, you know. And at Christmas time, they would send us the gifts. Uh, they sent everybody a, a wool flannel shirt, <laughs> a plaid, plaid flannel shirt, and, uh, and other things. And also, that we had a, we had a little a day room type activity there, and we had no 16 millimeter projector. Well, you know that you know big, huge reels like that, and so they would uh, uh, by air by air airplane they would drop uh, movies, you know, and they would be sixteen millimeter movies, and so we could watch a, a movie in the day room, you know, and uh, then uh, but uh, Christmas time they drop they drop uh, special things, you know, they drop uh, candies and stuff to us, they dropped. Uh, uh, in fact, there was a story I found online uh, of a plane that flew overhead over Padlopen Island, and it was a uh, chaplain wrote it because he was in the plane. The chaplain would come over, and anybody who wanted to be talk to the chaplain <laughs> would get, get on the radio. Uh, of course, I was a radio operator, so it was me, and I'd, I'd announce to everybody, "Hey, the airplane's coming over for the Christmas airdrop," you know. Anybody need to talk to the chaplain, you know? And so uh, they'd get online and talk to the chaplain if they wanted to, you know. <laughs> if they had something, or if they wanted somebody, maybe somebody to check on somebody or something in the back, hadn't heard from grandma or whatever, you know. And they'd talk to the chaplain. And uh, a lot of times the uh, commercial airline would come over, and uh, one of the stewardesses would get on the, on the line. And uh, they'd call it, here's a woman's voice, you know. <laughs> And so they'd, they'd get on uh, on our communicate on our channel and on our frequency, you know. The airlines all knew it because they knew what this frequency is on to get their weather report, you know. So we'd send out a weather report every 30 minutes. And uh, we'd send it out not knowing who it went to. It just we just sent it. And anybody, all the, all the uh, airlines might know that if you tune into this frequency at 5 minutes after the hour and 25 minutes after the hour, then uh, there's a... Uh, Radio men to get the weather report, so they'd get on our frequency and they'd uh, they'd call and 
a captain or somebody was calling the airline and said, "Hey, we got the, you guys want to talk to a woman, you know?" And so, so the, one of them would get on the on the uh, radio, you know, and we the, the guys would line up and just to say. But by the time it wasn't long before they were out of out of hearing distance, you know. So, but you get to say a few words, you know. And that was always a treat too. And then they drop Christmas trees, uh, not by parachute, but just just push it out of the plane. And uh, they'd, have to, they'd have to drop these three or four Christmas trees. And you've seen these Charlie, Charlie Brown Christmas trees on TV? Well, that's about what it looked like once they hit, the, once they hit you know. Because <laughs> it would be, most all the needles on the thing are gone, you know. And it's all you got is uh, 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 the, the center part and the limbs, you know, a few limbs on it, you know. But we'd decorate it anyway without all it in there and decorate the Christmas tree. and. And then uh, the weatherman sometime would get, uh, we, it, it, for what reason, I don't know, but each one, every once in a while, uh, Eskimos would come in and report in the summertime, report uh, uh, what we figured, figured later it was, was a periscope out in the bay. They'd come out of the um, uh, ocean area, you know, Arctic, and uh, they'd come up into the bay where, uh, which is Paddle Open Bay there. And then you'd see it, and they would come in and all excited and all because they'd see something sticking up out of the water, you know. And we we figured later what was a periscope, you know. The Russian, more than that, more like the Russian, watching us, you know. And, uh, but they'd come in all excited about, you know, and so by the time we'd go out and get out there, they'd be they'd be gone, you know. But we, there was a periscopes uh, spotted every once in a while, you know, in the summer. And they, uh, But they were the, the Eskimos in the, we decided to, run, you know, to do something for excitement, so so we would uh, decide to have a, all, we had all these colored parachutes that were beautiful, you know, silk, all silk and all, you know. So we took that one coincident hat and uh, we hung parachutes, colored parachutes all over it, you know. And so uh, we, had, we, had, we had wooden benches in there and stuff, and so we'd get the, uh, we'd invite the Eskimos about once a month invite the Eskimos to come over for a party and we'd show them uh, some of these film, uh, and usually westerns, you know, much more westerns. And we'd show them the westerns. They'd never seen nothing like that before. And even catalogs, the uh, women's club and all, they would send us uh, catalogs, you know, and, and and we'd go through the catalogs with the Eskimos because they had never seen a car, you know, had never seen a high-rise building and nothing to try to explain to them what they were, you know. And that one, that one uh, inquisitive young guy, uh, uh, I'll never forget his name, his name was, we called him was Cow Now. And I don't know, that's his Eskimo name. And uh, hardly any of them spoke any English, just a few, very few words. And I remember a couple of words, you know, like, it, like, uh, uh, like I, I don't know, was Sawami, I don't know, you know. So I remember a few words of Eskimo, and I learned a few words. And uh, so uh, we we they were interested in learning everything they could. So we we'd go through the catalogs with them, and they'd want to know what this is, what this is, what the names of these things were, you know. But we'd have a uh, so the uh, we'd make up a big batch of uh, lemonade or hot, usually hot chocolate in the winter time. And the and the winter time was the best time because the Eskimos would come on their dog sleds, you know. Of course, in the summertime, as long as the bay was, ice was gone, they could come with their boats, you know. They used their, used their boats were, uh, some of them were wooden, but most of them were uh, skin, made out of skin, you know, whale skin or something. And uh, they would come over, for, and we'd have maybe 40 or 50 Eskimos in there, in that coincident happened. And uh, so we ran a power line from our, we have a, all our power came from a, a generator. So we had a generator that uh, we had to keep fueled all the time, you know. And then uh, we ran an electric line down from there down to the chief's uh, Eskimo hut. And so he had a, we, we hooked up a light, he had a light bulb and a uh, outlet. So, he, so they, they, and somebody had given him a radio, you know, one of the guys, had, I guess, a portable radio. So they'd sat down there and uh, listen to the music and all of the radio. 
and the, and the chief's wife had a concertina, a little bit of, like a, uh, I don't know if you know what a concertina, it's like a, uh, uh, the, the polka music, you know, they play, but it's the smallest, but it's only about this big around and about that long. It's a concertina, it's a, it's still run on air, and it has a couple of keys on the ends of it. And so she'd listen to music down on the radio and learn how to play that, uh, some of the songs on that concertina, you know. And so they would play, uh, they'd have a, when they'd have a, we mainly did it for them, and they'd, uh, they'd play, the chief's wife would play, uh, that con play music on that concertina, and, uh, and they would dance and all, you know, <laughs> for Eskimo dances. And uh, so it was interesting, you know, and, the, uh, and the, we had one guy that took care of the uh, radio maintenance and the generator. And I, I never forget, he was a, and the chief wife took a liking to him. <laughs> and she would almost chase him down <laughs> when we had a, had a party, you know, and we, we, we all sat on benches there, and pretty soon I'd see the, and they they were all dialed up with their with their best clothes, you know, and um, all of them wearing wearing uh, seal uh, skins and all, mostly skins and all, fur and all, and, uh, and uh, of course they don't never take a shower, you know. They're, maybe in the summertime they might go down and bathe somewhere once once a year, but uh, uh, but she would uh, she'd sit down on that bench, you know, and uh, we got a kick out of it because. Uh, Jack, uh, the maintenance guy, he'd see, he'd see uh, I don't know what the chief's wife name but she'd sit down over there, pretty sure she'd scoot over next to him a little bit more, and Jack would move farther over, and she'd scoot over, and he'd scoot over, you know. <laughs> but we'd, uh, and sometimes we'd show a movie, and uh, and the most fun we had with them was getting, watching them, and we'd, uh, we'd all the movies, went, we don't, we'd only get a half a dozen movies, and and you don't get another airdrop for two months, maybe, or whatever, you know. So we'd already seen all the movies. So, so we would, instead of rewinding them after we, after we showed them there, we'd put them on and, and run them backwards. And so uh, we'd, when the Eskimos were around, we'd put the movies on the, uh, on the Western on and run them backwards. And you said the horses, horses running backwards, and uh, <laughs> everything's running backwards. You're jumping in galleys and all, you know, and jumping fences backwards. and of course, they they never seen a horse anyway, but they're laughing their butt off. You know, we're laughing at them. You know. <laughs> what did you look forward to most on a day to day basis while on the island? Oh boy, I don't know. We uh, there, there wasn't really anything to. Uh, me and one of the weather guys that worked the shift together, we kind of uh, buddied up, and uh, and each one of us uh, were, had a had a rifle, an army rifle. Air Force were given to give a rifle, and uh, all the ammunition that we wanted. And I guess it was in case we got invaded by the Russians. I don't know what they what they gave to us for, but we and. Uh, so uh, we'd go hunting sometime with the Eskimos, you know. They'd go seal hunting or war or something. So, so that was kind of neat. And then, uh, and then sometimes just he and I sometimes would. They've got they have a lot of snowshoe rabbits, uh, and also a, uh, a bird they call a tomaton. And they change colors with the wet with the season. The feathers and all change colors. So look it up sometime, tomaton. And uh, so we'd go out sometime hunting with Eskimos, hunting either snowshoe rabbits or tomicans, you know. And uh, and whoever was on duty at the time, uh, me and I can't remember, they and I called him Willie all the time, the uh, other weather guy. Whoever was on duty at the time was letting uh, doing the weather reports and all. Of course, they we had we had uh, tons of those old uh, weather balloons. Uh, they're, they're heavy rubber, like rubber latex, you know, and they blow them up with helium, and uh, and then uh, once they blow them up and let them go, well, we'd be way up on the other side of the island somewhere, you know, 
and once we see that way up there sometime, people are always complaining about the old rotten balloons, you know, break, busting when they get up a little ways in the atmosphere when they get there. And, and, and busting on you, you'd have to really do another one, you know. Sometimes you'd get two or three blown up and, uh, and let go before you get one that stayed up to, so you could get a buried on it. So we'd get on, we were on the other side of the island somewhere with the Eskimos, and we'd see one of those balloons going up there, so we'd shoot it. <laughs> we'd pop that balloon, pop that balloon, you know, and then uh, here it comes, to, of course it was down in, uh, and we, we wouldn't do too many of them, we'd do two or three of them, you know. And then uh, they didn't they didn't tie it on that that somebody shooting them down, but we'd come back and they were complaining about these rotten balloons they, the rotten weather balloons they got you know. I wish we'd get a new ship with balloons. These things are rotten you know. So what marked the end of your stay on the island? Well, we even though we, even though that was supposed to be like a we're supposed to be there for six months on the island on the uh, paddle opening. And then there was then it was going to be uh, six months back at Goose Bay, and so it was going to be twelve months rather than eighteen months. But it don't ever work out that way, you know, because the the weather is uh, you go in whenever whenever you can when the weather's and uh, yeah I don't remember exactly when we went in. I know uh, most of the ice on the bay had melted, you know, now in, in a little in paddle open bay. So we landed there on a, in a, on a seaplane, and then when we came out, you had to get, you had to get out. Then uh, usually they try to bring you out on a on a C forty seven. That's a two engine. Uh, that's what they call a DC three, and a civilian life DC three C forty seven. A C forty seven with skis on it, and so. Uh, as soon as the ice gets frozen out, thing that's on the bay, that that then they think they can get a plane in the land that would be safe to land on the ice, but you got to do it before it starts. They don't thaw out till like June, you know. So anytime, but uh, these don't get thick enough till like uh, say February, March, you know. And so somewhere around it would get thick enough. Somewhere, and then when the weather's right and the ice is thick enough and the conditions are right, and then you. Uh, we had to we set those take those empty uh, diesel fuel barrels and line them up all out on the bay to make like a runway, so they can see them because it's white, you know, and you know everything's white. So so you can see these. Uh, and sometimes we'd even uh, leave some diesel fuel in them and and uh, have a small flame on top of it. But uh, line diesel fuel barrels up out on the runway out on the bay, and then we take a. Uh, or we had a what they call a weasel. It's a uh, uh, track vehicle that goes as, on the on the water as well as on the land. They yeah, call it a, a duck. They call it a duck. A weasel, a duck. And you you go down. You can just uh, run it right out in the water. It's got a propeller on the back of it. If in the summertime, but then in the winter time, it's just got tracks on it also. So that's a, that was really useful. So we had a, a weasel there, and so uh, so we'd go out on there, and you drive and take take turns, like, like 24 hours a day practically, I take turns driving it back and forth there to pack the snow down on the uh, runway, before we were making the runway. So it just keep going back and forth, back and forth. And sometimes, by the time you get it, th you pack down where it's good and solid that the plane can land on it, you get a hell of a snowstorm. <laughs> And then it's right back over again, you know, right back over, and you got to go start and pack it down because you don't, you can't let that uh, C-47 land on uh, where you've got soft snow, you know, it's got to be packed down, you know. So you go again for hours and hours, and I mean days sometimes, uh, running it back and forth, or just the tracks on that vehicle, running back and forth, packing it down. You know? So finally, if you're lucky and the weather's right and you got it packed down right, and the ice is thick enough, and all these things have to be right at the right time. Then you let them know that uh, that, you, that you're ready to be picked up. You know that you, you can be that you can be picked up now. You know so they'll come in. And then I, I noticed, and I didn't know it until uh, I got to studying later. See, I, I left, and that was in '52. I was there in '52 and '53. And then uh, in '53. 
the Canadians took back over. Uh, you know, I guess when we came out, and then uh, and, and three years later in '56 they closed it. You know, the Canadians didn't want to take care of it. You know, so uh, shortly after I shortly after I spent my time there, well, uh, well I think shortly after they spent my time there, well, they uh, they closed the place. And the Canadians didn't want to run it. So how did you feel when you left the island when you first got back? Um, well, I got back, went back to Goose went back to Goose Bay, and then uh, shortly after that, um, I had hurt my knee. I guess when I was up in the Arctic and busted the cartilage in my knee, and so I was in the hospital at Goose Bay for a while, and then uh, and they they sent me to uh, to uh, St. John's in Newfoundland, the hospital at that time was Pepperell Air Force Base in St. John's, Newfoundland. They sent me to the hospital there to have my knee operated on. And then uh, then I came back to Goose Bay, and then uh, by that time it was uh, about time for me to, to leave and go back. My time was up, you know, by that. Uh, and uh, another thing I didn't know until uh, it was kind of, uh, I didn't know until I got home after I, when I left and went home, I, that my dad had died while I was gone, you know. And I didn't know it until I walked till I walked in the house, you know. And uh, I guess it was right in the middle of uh, he had died and my dad had died, and they had sent the uh, uh, Red Cross. They uh, they had got they had got a hold of the Red Cross to, uh, to try to locate me, you know. At that time, I was kind of in between. I wasn't on at Goose Bay and I wasn't at Padloping. I was a, and, and usually if you was at Padloping, they, they probably wouldn't have said anything anyway. But they, you know, they, you know uh, until I came back to Goose Bay, you know. But uh, while, I was, while I was fixing to leave Goose Bay, I, uh, they, somebody got a hold of me, Red Cross, and said they would got a message from my brother and them down in Mississippi and that my dad was in the hospital, you know, and and uh, but I happened to be on the way home anyway, so there wasn't nothing I could do. And at, at that time, there was a big blizzard, or I couldn't get out of Goose Bay for a, a week or two. And by the time I got home, there was no communication, of course, too. You know, by the time I got home, he had he was already he'd already passed away and been buried. You know, so that was a. Uh, that was unfortunate, but and I and I would have to be years later. I was in uh, station in Tai Taiwan, and my mother passed away while I was uh, in Taiwan. You know, I didn't get home for either one of the either one of the funerals. When you look back at your career in the North Area, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of. Well, I think for one thing, the the rank I achieved because I was a uh, uh, without a formal education, I ended up uh, uh, what what really really what allowed me to get the rank was not 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 long after I got out of basic training and went to Keesler, and uh, as sitting there as an instructor, well, I decided I ought to see if I could. Uh, Get a better education, and so I, somebody suggested I go down to try GED, you know, to take high school GED. And of course, I had not had any classes in high school or nothing, you know. So I went down and took the high school GED, and I, uh, the very first time I took it, I passed all five, there's five sections of it, and I passed all five sections of it. And so I said, well, that's pretty good. So then, uh, then. Uh, I, they sent me a thing from uh, Mississippi then, a, a equivalent certificate saying that I was considered a high, uh, high school graduate, you know. 
and then um, then many years later, I decided that in fact that when I got uh, oh in what in in six, 1961 years later, I but in the, in the meantime I had been studying taking correspondence courses, you know, uh, everything from. Uh, Math, uh, all sorts of um, math, uh, algebra, trig, uh, English, uh, history, social, everything, you know. I'd been taking correspondence courses through the military. And what they call uh, the uh, Armed Forces Institute. And I'd been taking all these courses and all that. And, and I figured maybe if anything, I'd be ready for college, uh, GED. So I, in 1961, then I. I took the college GED and passed uh, four sections of it, and passed all four of those the first time I took it. You know. So uh, even though I, I, I even though I had no formal high school or college education, I have both the high, high school and college GED. You know. I think that and 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 having done that and all the courses and all I took, uh, uh, I'm talking in military as well as uh, I mean technical courses as well as. Uh, uh, educational courses uh, was what allowed me to be get promoted because otherwise that uh, most people would have been sitting there for all that time and really, probably would only have been probably a staff sergeant you know because uh, I think mainly because of that and uh, I, I had some pretty pretty high position I, I was a uh, uh, I worked at the fifth Air Force headquarters in uh, Japan could you State Air Station Japan. I was the uh, primary missile man there, and I was. Uh, then I worked in. Uh, I went to um, Strategic Air Command. I worked in SAC for a uh, number of years as a missile man. Then I went to uh, Tactical Air Command at headquarters. Tactical Air Command. And I was the uh, primary missile man there. You know, so uh, where I. I uh, that uh, I wrote all the uh, operations orders, the, uh, uh, the uh, every, uh, everything to do with running the missile outfits, you know. So, because uh, I worked myself up through the through the through the grades, you know, and and did that. So, and you even even now, whenever I, from my from my skill, I'm I'm listed. I was listed as a uh, missile electronics uh, superintendent. And uh, there's only like five people in the whole Air Force of uh, my grade as a chief master sergeant in that field. You know. When you retired from the Air Force, what was life like after the Well, I, I debated. I, I was at TAC headquarters at Langley, Virginia when I retired. And... Uh, my my last pay raise uh, would be, uh, you know, I, I was already a, uh, at that time was the chief master sergeant, and so there was no more pay raises for me. So uh, I, I was the max grade I could go, and uh, extremely lucky and in a way unfortunate and work hard to get that grade, and then. Uh, then I uh, I decided it was time for me to get out. I was uh, I didn't want to wait till I got too old to when, when I retired. I knew I'd have to st continue working, you know, and I couldn't just retire. So uh, I didn't want to stay any longer because I'd maybe be too old, you know, to find a job on the outside. So but when I finally decided to retire, uh, I had 26, uh, 26 years, six months, and twenty. And 25 days. So anything over 26 years or six months, I get credit for 27 years. So, uh, so I applied for a job uh, maybe with about a year before I started to retire with a AE Staley Manufacturing Company up in Lafayette, Indiana, and they uh, they make uh, Staley's corn starch, corn sweeteners. And so on and so forth, you know. And they were building a new plant in Lafayette, Indiana. They've been around for, for many, many, many years. 
and uh, they were building a new plant in Lafayette, Indiana that was uh, totally computerized and uh, also non-union, which was the first one that had ever been done like it. So uh, I signed, I applied for a job with them as an instrument engineer. And uh, so they uh, they sent me, I, they, they, I went to, they sent me, asked me to come up there for an interview. So I went up there one weekend, uh, while I was still working at Langley Attack Headquarters. Went up there one weekend and was interviewed. And came back and then within a few days they sent me and said, uh, it's funny at times that I, I didn't know, I hadn't, I hadn't been in the, never had a civilian job except grunt work, you know. And I, uh, I didn't know what to ask for a salary. You know, they want. They ask you when you find. So my my people around me that worked at TAC there I, at headquarters, I asked him some of the some of the guys didn't know. You know, the, most of the officers, uh, for what I should ask for a salary and all. So at that time, uh, fourteen thousand a year was uh, a good good salary. So he said, ask for fourteen thousand a year. You know, and he said they can always uh, you know uh, give it to you or not. You know, or whatever. So, uh, so I, they, when they asked me what I wanted, you know, I said for fourteen thousand. You know, they didn't bat an eyelash. They gave it to me. You know, <laughs> at fourteen thousand a year. That was in nineteen seventy six. So they, uh, and, and so December thirty first, nineteen seventy six. I retired. They wanted me to go to work the first of January. The next day, as I retired. And, but I had to, uh, once I retired, I had to move my family off base. I was living in government quarters, so I had to move off base. So I said, I can't do it, the, you know, the next day. I said, give me, give me 10 days, you know. So, uh, so I found a place in the apartment and moved my family off base, you know. But I didn't want to move them up there until I got there and found a place where I was going. I was uh, so I, uh, I, they gave me 10 days, and so I, I so I retired the 31st of December and then got moved off base and all and went to work up there on the 10th of January. And so I, I set up a training program. The biggest thing you wanted was I, I was in charge of all the, uh, all the um, computers and uh, uh, instrumentation, no matter what it was, whether it was hydraulics, pneumatics, electrical, computer, uh, uh, all of it. I was the I was the instrument engineer, and I uh, and they, the biggest thing they wanted me to do was set up a training program, you know, because it was non-union, and they didn't have a they didn't have a training program set up. And I the new plant being built. So I was there. I was one of the first twelve people they hired. They hired the initial twelve people, and each one of these twelve people had to learn a section of the plant, you know. A certain section of the plant, and I had uh, learned a section that's called the wet mill. And that was in addition to my instrumentation duties. I had an instrumentation instrumentation as well as the uh, process of how the called the process how the corn is processed and all. You know. So I had to, so I worked there. But the main thing they wanted me to do was set up a training program for uh, for all of the skills, you know. So I stayed there three years. Instead of them, the biggest thing I did there was, I was in charge of all the instrumentation people, but I set up a training program for uh, all the skill, all the skills, and uh, then I decided uh, I didn't need any more of that cold weather, so I left. And I, in fact, I went to work. We came back and went to work with FEMA, disaster people. You know. Is there? Anything else that you would like to share that we haven't covered? No, no, I don't uh, know of anything else. Now, now later on, uh, ten years later, I went uh, remote again, but that was at uh, Cartwright Air Station, also in, in Labrador. But uh, that was a regular radar, radar uh, site, and probably had a hundred people or so on it, you know. But it wasn't as isolated. There was little. There was a little town there with a Hudson Bay store, and so on, you know, and there was a lot more people there. That was a, 
but I was stationed at another, another remote site. And you know, it depends on your skill level, you know, when you, I mean, depend on your career, what type of work you do. I just thought had to be in electronics and all. I ended up with skills that were mostly used on remote sites, you know, all over here. But uh, it was a, uh, there's nothing I could have done better for myself in the whole world than join the military. I mean, there's no, uh, no doubt. See, I, uh, I, that's the best choice. I can not, I can't think of anything else I could have done. But I got an education. I made, I made, I made good money at the, in the, in there once I built my rank up, you know. And then I retired with a with a, with a decent salary, you know. So I couldn't have, couldn't have been any better. Okay, that will conclude this interview. Thank you very much for your time, this okay. friend. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you for the